Tonight, my friends, we stand on the brink of a feat unparalleled in space exploration. I will travel where no man has dared to go. Into the black hole? Why, that's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. Uh. Uh. Black holes are the abysses of the universe. They're not really a thing, but rather a region of space-time folded into an embrace so tight that even light is forever ensnared. And it's this nihilism that poses a major problem for theoretical physics, one which could unravel our very understanding of the universe itself. How does a black hole trap light? If I throw a ball into the air, it falls back down to Earth due to gravity following a curve. Or at least to me, it looks like a curve. But really, the ball is following the shortest line, also called a geodesic, and it's space-time that's truly curved. It's the mass of the Earth that curves space-time, and if we made it heavier, then we'd increase that curvature, and thus the ball would appear to follow a tighter curve back to the ground. Curiously then, although we often speak of gravity as a force in this picture that Einstein painted for us, there is no force, just curved space-time. Now, if I threw the ball hard enough, it would travel higher and thus take longer to come back down. And if I threw it really hard, I could give it enough speed that it totally escaped Earth's gravity and flew out into deep space. The minimum speed need to achieve this is known as the escape velocity, and classically it can be solved by setting the kinetic energy of the ball equal to its gravitational potential energy. In 1783, John Mitchell did exactly that for a beam of light. He predicted that there should exist a certain mass which is so great that the escape velocity equals the speed of light. Mitchell called these dark stars, but Nobody really took them very seriously until GR came along. That's Einstein's theory of general relativity. While serving for Germany during the First World War, Karl Schwarzschild found a solution to GR, something that Einstein did not expect to be achieved so easily. But his solution researched the possibility of these dark stars, something considered implausible by Einstein and many others. By 1971, the astronomical discovery of Cygnus X1 provided the first evidence that this wasn't a trick of the math, but a real phenomenon. A black hole, as physicist John Wheeler later dubbed them. Of course, since then, we've accumulated a wealth of observational support for their existence, from X-ray binaries to tidal disruption events, from gravitational wave astronomy to direct imaging. These enigmas that were so distasteful to Einstein are now understood to be a critical component to the universe. For example, with a supermassive black hole appearing to be located in the center of every galaxy. Before we explore further, let's just take a quick beat for our sponsor. Finding good B-roll for esoteric topics like black holes and quantum theory and all the other stuff that we get into here isn't easy. If you're a creator like me, then the sponsor of today's video, Storyblocks, is an invaluable tool in the editing room. Storyblocks offer unlimited downloads of diverse and high quality media for a single subscription cost, no extra charges for individual clips. We create B-roll clips from many places like NASA, ESO, sci-fi films, but there's often missing pieces, and trust me, this is the slowest and most painful part of editing, finding that perfect clip. Not only do Storyblocks make this much easier, but they've also got templates for After Effects, Premiere Pro and DaVinci, as well as royalty-free music, sound effects, and more. To get started with unlimited stock media downloads at one set price, head to storyblocks.com slash cool worlds. Just that little action helps us out too. Once again, that is storyblocks.com slash cool worlds. Now back to the video. Black holes are intoxicating because of their finality, an absolute end. Anything that falls in can never come out. But that also raises a problem. They seemingly destroy information for breakfast. In quantum theory, a basic precept is so-called unitarity, which essentially states that all processes are, in principle, reversible. 
For example, if I throw a book into a fire, it will quickly smolder, burn, and dissipate away into fine particles of smoke and ash. In principle, unitarity dictates that we should be able to collect up all of those particles, piece them back together, and reconstruct every word on every page. Of course, in practice, you'd never be able to pull this off, but in theory, it is possible. This principle of unitarity is often cast as a conservation law for information, akin to the conservation laws that we have for energy and momentum. But really, it's best to think of it as a statement of reversibility. Starting from some initial state, we should be able to calculate the final state, and vice versa, from the final state, we can go back and calculate the initial state, hence reversible. The black holes are the cosmic wrecking ball to the principle of unitarity. If I throw a book into the black hole, then those words, that information becomes trapped within a region of space-time from which nothing can escape. It's true that the book's mass will cause a slight ripple in space-time as it falls in, like the black hole merger events observed by LIGO recently. But it turns out that those gravitational waves do not carry enough information away with them to reconstruct the words on the page. Now, as that book falls further into that dark abyss, far beyond the event horizon, it will eventually reach the singularity. We usually think of the singularity as a location in space, the center of the black hole. But really, the warping of space-time is so severe here that space and time swap roles. And really, the singularity is best described as a future moment in time, a point in our future from which we cannot avoid reaching any more than we can avoid tomorrow from happening. What happens when you reach the singularity is anyone's guess. General relativity explodes to infinities at this point. This uncertainty gave physicists hope that the apparent destruction of information was not real. Maybe the information just gets trapped right down there near the singularity or something. At the end of the day, it didn't really matter because black holes seem to live forever and hence we never actually have to deal with this information loss. This convenient excuse fell apart when Stephen Hawking came along and showed that black holes don't live forever, as initially assumed. Quantum theory demands that they slowly evaporate. The event horizon is just a region of empty space, and like all empty space, Heisenberg's uncertainty principle allows for the spontaneous creation of particle pairs fizzling in and out of existence. Usually, these particles form and merge within the briefest of intervals, popping in and out of existence so fast that the universe doesn't have a chance to notice and complain. But if this particle pair pops up either side of the event horizon, one can fall in and the other can escape. From the outside, the black hole seems to radiate energy away, which means by equals mc squared, it is losing mass. This Hawking radiation means that black holes are gradually, very, very gradually, losing mass, and thus they will eventually die. It's an unsettling thought. Not only do stars eventually die, but even black holes one day perish. So the fact that black holes die means that we cannot ignore the information that they gobbled up. By the principle of unitarity, we expect reversibility, so I should be able to collect up all that Hawking radiation, like the smoke and ash from the fire, and reconstruct the bug. But Hawking radiation doesn't comply, which can be understood in two ways. First, according to general relativity, a black hole can be completely described by just three numbers. Its mass, its spin, and its charge. It has no surface features, no texture, and we call this the no-hair theorem. As a result, the Hawking radiation they emit can be thought of as purely thermal radiation, heat. And in fact, the temperature of that heat is completely governed by the mass of the black hole. So, if we collected up all the Hawking radiation, we could reconstruct the mass of everything that fell into the black hole over time. But we wouldn't be able to reconstruct the arrangement of the particles that go into that mass. We couldn't reconstruct the book. The second way to understand this is through quantum entanglement. When a pair of particles pop up on the horizon, they are always entangled. This means that they are described by not two wave functions, but by just one joint wave function, which describes the superposition of their states. 
So for example, this wave function might say that the sum of the spins of these two particles is zero, but it doesn't tell us which one is up nor which one is down. When we measure one of these two particles, the entanglement breaks, and this measured particle is forced to choose one of those two states, which instantaneously causes the other particle to choose the opposite state. In this way, the ledger remains a balance. We don't accidentally end up with two upspins by mistake. By the way, if you're wondering, no, you cannot use this for faster than light communication. See our earlier video as to why. Now for Hawking radiation, this entanglement poses a barrier to getting information out of the black hole. Let's say that I threw into a black hole the information X, Y. For this information to escape, we can imagine one Hawking radiation particle escaping at some later time and carrying away the X, and then at an even later time, one carrying away the information Y. But the problem is, how does that second emitted particle know to carry Y and not X. That implies that it somehow knows that X has already been emitted. So to keep appraised of the full ledger of emitted information, we need these emitted particles to be entangled to one another. Fine, but there's the problem because remember that those Hawking radiation particles are already entangled to their negative energy partner that fell into the black hole. And entanglement, like lobsters, are strictly monogamous. There's no mistresses or swinger parties here. They cannot be polygamously entangled. So this means that we have a paradox. Now, whenever we have a paradox, we can typically resolve them by removing one of the assumptions upon which the paradox sits. So, for example, with the famous Fermi paradox, which is where are all the aliens, we can resolve that by trivially removing the assumption that aliens exist. Paradox resolved. No! No! So, what are the assumptions here? Well, there are three basic ingredients. The principle of unitarity, which we've already met, and then on top of that we have the equivalence principle and locality. The equivalence principle is Einstein's happiest thought, that if someone fell from a roof, they would not feel their own weight, as if there were no gravity. A consequence of this is that when someone passes the event horizon of a black hole, they wouldn't actually experience anything different. They wouldn't notice any demarcation. So that means that outside the black hole, we have just empty space, and similarly on the horizon, we also just have empty space, hence why Hawking radiation can occur there. The third preset is locality, which is the trickiest to explain, but essentially says that if you drop a stone in a pond, the sound, the splash, and the resulting ripple don't happen everywhere at once. They are localized to a specific point. It's pretty hard to imagine classical physics without locality. And so you can see that all three of these precepts are foundational to modern physics, and it would be painful to give up any of them. So which is it? Well, we don't know. But certainly, many physicists have come up with many different ideas. For example, in a famous wager by Hawking and Kip Thorne against John Preskill, they hedged that the information that falls into the black hole was irretrievably lost to the universe. Although it has to be said that Hawking later changed his mind on this and conceded the bet. Roger Penrose is in this camp too, and indeed his conformal cyclic cosmology model, which is a kind of cyclic universe scenario, critically depends on the condition that information is in fact lost inside black holes. But today, most of the community believe that unitarity is preserved, and somehow the information does get out of the black hole, which means we have to update our theories of how black holes work. There are many ideas out there. There are several variations of the information simply being dumped somewhere else. And this could be a baby universe inside the black hole, episodes where the black hole reverses into a white hole that spits out information, or that the black hole is in fact a wormhole to somewhere else. Recently, the idea of many micro wormholes existing has been suggested. Perhaps the particle that falls in enters a tiny wormhole inside the event horizon that carries it back out, and that's why we see Hawking radiation. Zooming out, it's also been suggested that information is indeed lost in our universe, but at the multiverse level, information is still conserved. 
Personally, anything involving multiverses feels like an immediate cop-out. It's kind of like saying aliens did it. And anything involving wormholes risks violating causality, which Hawking argued was sacred. But Hawking did concede the bet, remember? So what persuaded him that unitarity could be preserved? As strange as it sounds, a path towards resolution might come from holograms. What about the droid attack on the Wookiees? In 1993, Leonard Susskind suggested the notion of black hole complementarity. Someone who falls into the black hole indeed seems to carry their information past the horizon and eventually reach the singularity itself. But someone watching from the outside of the black hole wouldn't see this. Because of the extreme time dilation down here, they would see the astronaut actually seem to slow down in time as they approach the horizon and eventually even seem to freeze there. They wouldn't actually cross the threshold. Yet more, their light is redshifted and warped around the black hole. From the outside, the infalling person appears to be smeared across the horizon into a quantum thin layer. Eventually, their information re-radiates from this thin layer back out into space as Hawking radiation and thus, information is conserved. But this picture seems to violate and contradict the astronaut's own experience. Suskin suggested that both perspectives are right and although they contradict, they can never actually come together to note the discrepancy and thus the universe is actually okay with us. This creates the strange idea that the information is stuck there, hovering in this incredibly thin layer just above the surface of the event horizon. But a surface is a 2D geometry, and we usually think of black holes as 3D phenomena. Surely a 3D object contains far more information than the 2D surface. It turns out, not. In fact, this has now been proven mathematically that the information content of a black hole can always be completely described by just its 2D surface. Indeed, this has now been generalized to basically everything. All 3D volumes must follow this rule. They can never hold more information than that which can be contained by their 2D surfaces. Yet more, if you try to, you'd end up making a black hole, which also, of course, adheres to this rule. This is the holographic principle, that all 3D phenomena can in fact be reduced down to a 2D representation. We are all holograms, empty projections, just ghostly shells, nothing more. This equivalency, formerly known as the anti de Sitter conformal field theory correspondence, is a stunning result. But it doesn't actually prove that we are all truthfully holograms, merely that this is an explanation which is fully compatible with everything we know about the universe. Nevertheless, it was enough to persuade Hawking to concede the bet. The unitarity principle appears to survive. But in its place, we sacrifice one of those other three key precepts, locality, because now what originally seemed to be distinct 3D events are all in fact collapsed onto a 2D surface. But perhaps Hawking was premature to concede the bet, as Kip Thorne thought, who refused to concede. Because despite the progress made, questions remain here. Remember that Hawking radiation stems from the particle pairs produced in the vacuum near the horizon, and thus they are monogamously entangled. And also remember that information leakage requires the Hawking radiation particles to be entangled to each other at different times. So we still have an apparent contradiction that requires solving, and as always, the best way to solve any paradox is to let go of one of your assumptions. What if the Hawking radiation particles do not emerge from an empty vacuum, but instead from a something? In that case, the sum of two entangled states need not be zero, like spin up, spin down. Instead, they could sum to something, because they didn't come from nothing, they came from something. In this way, information can get out of the black hole whilst preserving the rules of entanglement. The implication is unsettling, though. At the event horizon, there must exist a fiery thin layer known as the firewall, which incinerates anything that tries to fall into the black hole. If this idea bothers you, 
it should. Many physicists don't like it. After all, this violates the equivalence principle. Being incinerated at the event horizon is hardly Einstein's happiest thought. And so many physicists are still reaching for some other explanation. Those baby universes don't sound quite so unappealing now, do they? A deeper issue in all of this is that, yes, we can come up with many possible explanations to resolve the information paradox, but how do we prove them? Obviously, flying into a black hole would help, but you'd discover the answer and never be able to share it. You know, it would be incredibly cruel if the universe insisted upon this as the only way which she would allow us to unlock her secrets, the ultimate deal with the devil. The equation couldn't reconcile relativity with quantum mechanics. You need more. More. More what? More data. You need to see into a black hole. In principle, studying Hawking radiation would help, since we can measure its entropy, for example. But Hawking radiation is so pitiful that there's really no hope of observationally measuring it. We'd have to build a micro black hole in the laboratory for this, and such energy scales are still far beyond our abilities. And so, it's quite possible that this puzzle will be with us for a very long time. A puzzle of which we can dream up many allowed mathematical solutions to, but frustratingly, we just can't prove any of them. But working on this is still valuable. Insights, like the holographic principle, are changing the way we approach fundamental physics and providing new mathematical tools to make further progress. In truth, studying black holes may be our best hope for a unified theory of quantum gravity, the secret source to the ultimate theory of everything. Who knew that studying something so dark could reveal so much? So, until next time, stay thoughtful and stay curious. Hey, thank you so much for watching this video, everybody. I hope you enjoyed it. Be sure to hit the like and subscribe buttons. If you want to become a supporter to my research team, the Coolwoods Lab, you can use the link up above, down below. I sincerely appreciate it. And if you haven't already seen it, we have a podcast. Just go to Coolwoods Podcast on YouTube. Again, links down below and check that out too. Thanks again for watching.